It's been about 18 months since I moved in here at the Epic Homestead full time. So in today's video, I'm taking you on a full tour of everything that's changed in 2022. Let's start off here in the backyard where I'm standing in a patch that in one way hasn't really changed at all since I bought the place. And in some ways, of course, as you see around me, has changed tremendously. Tons of plants here. This is the untamed cover crop area. So what you see around me is just a mix of mustard, barleys, legume crops, all that kind of stuff that we put in in fall as a fall cover crop to break up the soil, to add some nutrients back to the soil. And the next step behind me is to come in with a scythe or a machete or something and chop and drop all this material so we can actually incorporate it into the soil and start building that soil a little bit more. Typically with a cover crop, you really wouldn't let it get to this flowering point. You might chop it right before it flowers. So that's on the task list at some point. We'll be doing more videos on that, but I wanna call your attention to this right here. This is our winter wheat crop. Last year we planted spring wheat, harvested it sometime in late summer. We did okay, we learned a lot, we made a couple videos on it. But this year, the winter wheat we planted, of course, in winter, and it's doing a lot better. A couple changes really helped us there. It was more moisture, it was burying the seeds a little bit last time we surface sowed them, and quite frankly, it's just paying a little more attention to them. So you should see an incredible crop of wheat come out soon. And I wanna say, it is weirdly going to be an important crop this year if we know what's going on geopolitically right now. Wheat, the spring wheat planting, may or may not happen in the bread basket of the world. And so it's an incredibly easy crop to grow at home and I encourage you to try it. One of the pride and joy projects that we completed in the backyard was the Epic Pond in partnership with Aquascapes. Simply masterful, simply a masterpiece, I have to say. It's one of the most enjoyable pieces of this backyard right now. We have two things in the pond that are edible, besides the fish. I'm not eating the koi that are in there, but we have taro, so we're growing some elephant's ear or taro, and then we're also growing some watercress, and that was almost completely accidental here in the pond. We set some watercress in a couple net pots, just in some rockwool cubes, kind of like a hydroponic setup, because watercress likes to grow that way, and then they accidentally fell into the pond and started growing like crazy, so it's an incredibly vibrant ecosystem that started to develop. All the plants that we've put in, whether it be this rush, these lilies, the water hawthorn, all this has really exploded if you take care of the pond ecosystem. So the next step here at the homestead is to start to landscape around the pond and build a little bit more of a pond ecosystem. Because what I've started to notice are insects that simply just wouldn't be here otherwise. Water striders, I'm hoping I can get a frog at some point in time. We'll have to see. But the next step here again is landscaping around the pond. The seedling table is looking a lot more full this time of year. Pretty much no matter where you are watching this video, it's time to at least think about starting seeds. We've been starting them religiously at least a tray of 72 seeds a week, every week since about a couple weeks ago. So basically since the beginning of March, if not a little bit earlier, I'm gonna show you just a couple things that we're growing right now. A lot of sunflowers up here in the front. We've got a lot of herbs, different types of basil down here. And then really quickly, just kind of came up with this little method here. We have our Epic 6-cell trays, which a lot of you know and love. And then we have this new one, the Epic 4-cell tray, which you can either start something like tomatoes, peppers, melons, something that really prefers a little more soil. Just direct sow it directly into here instead of doing a pot up process. But if you want a pot up, we came up with this little funky tool, which is not available yet, little prototype, that makes it really simple. So if you have a lot of potting up to do, check this out. This is a Russian mammoth sunflower. Of course, you could take this little plug here and just put this into the ground, but if you want to give it a little more time or you're growing it indoors, watch this. This is really handy. You take this, you got your four cell right here. You come in, you give it a little dib, just like that. You got a nice depression, and in goes the seedling. Once you water that in, soil sort of fuses together and you're good to go. So that's what's going on here at the beginning of the season here at the seedling table. Here in the backyard, I've really cultivated a love for in-ground gardening. In fact, this backyard plot, I consider more of a micro farm than I do a traditional urban garden, but of course, the urban gardening stuff is in the front yard, which we'll see in a second. Back here, what we really did this year was redesign the whole space. We only had a couple beds over the past couple years. There's eight six by six beds here where I'm standing. And then over there, there's two longer beds that are filled with alliums. So onions, leeks, garlic, right in front of me, Brussels sprouts, cabbages these need to come out right now it's about 85 degrees fahrenheit 30 degrees celsius in the end of march they need to come out of the ground behind me you've got a plot with fennel you've got nasturtium you've got bachelor buttons and then behind that is kind of a fun little experiment we did lazy gardening with root crops in the winter where we just took 
radish and beets, threw handfuls on the ground, scratched them in with a bowhead rake, watered that in and just saw what happened. And as you can see, they're lush and full of radishes and beets that some have flowered, that's fine, pollinators coming in, but the rest were just pulling up handfuls of root crops day after day. The last thing I'll say about this area is we did do a single till as we restructured this area, which I think is responsible for a lot of the positive results we've seen here. And I don't plan to till again, and I made a whole video on that, but that single till to break up some of the clay and work in more organic matter really, really helped. I can't help but show off one of these Brussels sprout stalks that we got this year. Many more to come, like I said, we have to harvest them, but what I'm standing in front of here is at least a partially built outdoor garden sink. Something I really wanted to do was make sure that I could clean off all my produce that I'm harvesting and bringing in to cook and share with friends and family before it gets into the house, which allows me to do something that I'm big on here at the homestead, which is water reclamation. If it was being washed in the kitchen sink, I would not be able to do that. That's considered something you cannot convert to a gray water system, which I've converted most of my house to. But out here, what I can do is come in, take my Brussels sprout stock, wash off whatever I need to wash off, and this drains to a bucket that I then use to water out in the yard. So we're gonna build a couple more elements here, some shelving units, a drying rack here, and actually what you see in front of you is something else that hooks into my gray water system, which is going to be a future outdoor shower. You get pretty dirty when you're gardening, and it'd be nice to rinse off before you get into the house and have that water go out to the citrus orchard in the front yard. One of the biggest new additions this year to the homestead is the incredible epic coop. This is from Carolina Coops. It's six foot by 18 foot. And yes, I actually have chickies in here right now that I raised from chicks in the coop right now, chirping away. I put them in just a couple days ago. So come on in and I'll introduce you. So we've made our way in the coop. You see I have the little feeder, the water and the grit. And I also dropped off a huge cabbage for them that they've been absolutely decimating. In fact, if you turn this over, they've kind of dug it out from the inside. So let's introduce you to these little girls. First of all, this one does not have a name yet. Open to it in the comments, but we have a silver laced Wyandotte right here. Very, very pretty bird. And actually this is her sister. This is Gucci, the gold laced Wyandotte that may be a rooster and we're not still sure yet. So <laughs> let me know. I hope, I hope she's not, but she may be a rooster. Now this little cutie right here is little Lav. This is a Lavender Orpington. Very, very fluffy. She's the youngest. They have been picking at her a little bit, not too much, but I'm hoping that she kind of becomes a member of the flock. Then right here, you have the Rhode Island Red. Gorgeous, gorgeous breed. You can actually see her little neck fluff is starting to fall away and the feathers are coming in. And then we have the fatty. This girl right here, oh, say hi, this is Butta. Butta is the Buff Orpington, which is one of the friendliest breeds you can see. I mean, she does have some very significant breasts right there. She is very fat and fluffy, very, very friendly, typically loves to be picked up. And then finally, we have the cream leg bar who's running away right there. That's sort of a more rare English breed. See that little tuft on her head? Very, very cute little chicken, but so far has displayed the least personality. So I would say Butta has probably displayed the most. These chickens are about four or five weeks old now. I think probably five weeks and they are loving, loving life, but they're in their teenage phase and they don't wanna stay near you when you grab them, so I'm letting them be right now. As we come out into the front yard, I cannot help but show off this artichoke patch that, believe it or not, I personally have never watered in my entire life. In fact, my laundry machine has watered it. This is the output area for my laundry gray water where you're using a biodegradable soap. We actually did a full video on it on the Epic Homesteading channel, which you can check out, but I wanted to talk quickly about these plants. These are a fantastic perennial option. If you're in a colder zone, you may want to take them indoors, but you cut them back at the end of the season. So you're growing them in a grow bag, which is a fantastic way to do it. What you wanna do is chop them down and then bring them in and bring them back out. For me, I just chop them down, leave them in place right here. But as you can see, they're coming back with an absolute vengeance and you can let them flower. It's one of the more pretty flowers you'll ever see. It's in the thistle family. Or of course you can eat the immature flower, which is all the artichoke is. And there you go. You have a beautiful, delicious, constantly producing plant that actually propagates itself. It'll put off offshoots and you can either separate those or let those continue to grow. In fact, a couple of these that you see here are just multiple clumped together, which is why they look so lush and bushy. But it's a fantastic way to have a perennial low maintenance crop that when hooked up at least to this gray water, I don't even have to water at all. Something I am very happy to announce is that the arbor here has found a home. 
because we put in some pavers that finally tie the front and the backyard of the homestead together. So they start at the garden gate over in the raised bed section, they come out here to this little micro patio, and then you have this arbor, and then it shoots right back through Dragon Fruit Alley, but not without coming through this beautiful moon arbor that I've been waiting for a place to put something on this at the homestead. So I have two climbing roses, same exact variety. It's a white, small little rose, and it's gonna absolutely fill this probably by the middle of spring. The citrus orchard has become very lush and very vibrant and we've done a couple little things here that i think have helped it quite a bit the first is a late winter pruning so i came through all the citrus are on this side everything over here is something different so we have two different types of pomegranate there's a papaya that you can't see right there and then we have an apple a nectarine and two peaches down on this side but right here this is a citrus hedge and the logic here because it seems crazy to plant them this close together, and it kind of is, maybe I'm gonna regret this in a couple years, is that they will form a wall, absolute wall if properly pruned, and what I'll have, successive ripening throughout the year, a variety of all sorts of different citrus. I have grapefruit, I have lime, I have yuzu, I have oranges, four different types, blood oranges, and so this is gonna be really, really good. Now, what has helped this a lot is getting some actual irrigation set up here at the homestead, which I'll talk about at some point in the future, but also this is where all that shower water comes from. So the shower gray water system comes into two basins that fall in this section right here and this section right over here. So every time I'm taking a shower, whether it be indoors or in the eventual outdoor shower that I have here at the homestead, the water will come here. And of course, yes, you have to change the type of soaps and shampoos that you use, but I think it's a worthy sacrifice to send thousands of gallons of double use water into a productive orchard instead of straight down the drain. We're starting to get into the section of the garden that is for you smaller space growers. Of course, that's how I started here at Epic Gardening, so I never want to let that go. So what we have here is an interesting experiment. I'm very curious on the results of it. I think I have a hunch, but basically what we've done is we've used five, seven, 10, and 15 gallon grow bags. These ones are from a company called Root Pouch. I quite literally wrote a book on grow bag gardening. So we've tested out a lot of different grow bags. So far, Root Pouch has won out in most of our testing. So it is the one that we ended up carrying on the Epic Gardening shop. So you can grab these from us if you want to, but the experiment is pretty simple. It is the same exact soil mix, the same exact plants. So these are all jalapenos bought at the same exact time from the same exact nursery, same with those tomatoes right there. And the only difference is the container size, five, seven, 10, 15. So what we're gonna finally find out is how much of a difference does container size make if every other thing is kept equal. So stay tuned. I have a hunch the biggest one's going to win, but maybe we'll find something interesting in these middle ranges where a seven gallon does just as good as a five gallon, for example. So you might want to go with a five to cram more plants in. We finally made it to the front yard raised bed garden, which is my homage to my original Epic Garden that many of you OG subscribers know about. It seems like a long time ago. It seems like a different world since we were at that property. And in many ways, it actually is a different world. And it's never been more important to start growing some of your own food. So what we have changed in the front yard, not a whole lot. We've added a lot of beds down there, which I'll show you in a second. But you see these little PVC pipes that are popping up. That's because we finally plumbed up some irrigation and designed some custom kits that will actually irrigate these raised beds on autopilot. So here in this tall eight and one, let me walk you through how this system works. What you have is you have an input, which has a pressure regulator right here. Make sure you don't pop this system off. This is the main line. You can shut off an entire bed just by going like this. The whole thing is off now. This turns it on, water will flow down. Then what ends up happening is it gets over here. We have another one. I'll show you what that's for in a second here. Let's just pretend that's on. What this does then is water will come out through this drip line. And what we've done is planted plants right on the drip emitters. So you have perfect spacing of these greens that just gets watered on autopilot. Now, the reason I have a shutoff valve here and a shutoff valve right here seems a little crazy is, look, if I shut this one off, now there's only water in this section of the main line. And what can end up happening is you can put up these little adjustable sprayers so you can direct sow in a bed and have the whole thing 
covered instead of just getting water out of the drip emitter. So it's a kind of a dual modular system. And here's the rest of the front yard. We've added a few beds. This small urban round bed, I really love the look of. This one I just planted some Alaska variegated nasturtiums in. And then over here, we just built these ones out. We've got the tall urban round and the tall nine in one, and just a couple others here. And then of course, you get back to the backyard where we'll talk about rainwater collection. Hiding behind these fence doors is actually a 5,000 gallon rainwater collection cistern that I have completely full right now, believe it or not, here in San Diego. So I'm gonna walk you through how the water even gets into this and then how we use it. Let's just take a quick peek inside and I'll show you just how much water there is. I only had to put my hand down about a foot or so before it got wet. What you see here is the gutter system that collects all the water off my entire roof. And then what you have is what's called a leaf filter. As the name implies, it just catches large debris from the water before it can get into the rainwater system. Then what you have is what's called a first flush filter. This pipe right here on the right side collects the first 10 ish gallons of water that's the dirtiest. And then when that fills up, it diverts it over this way which is actually the one that goes to the rainwater system. So that pipe runs underground. I'm gonna walk you all the way over. And yes, I will show you the mess because that's what the garden is like. I'm gonna show you it as it is, not as I want it to be. So as you walk under, there's a pipe that goes right here all the way over to the rainwater collection system here. And then the feeder pipe is this one right here. And you might be wondering, well, how does the water get up? As long as this entry point is lower than that entry point over there, the water will go up and into the system. The way that water comes out right now is with this valve right here. So this would turn it on. And then you have flexible PVC into a pressure sensitive pump. This one is called the Walrus HQ200, which goes to a hose, which you can then connect to whatever you want out here. So even here in California, I have been watering these giant, beautiful cabbages you see here with collected rainwater in an area that gets sometimes less than 10 inches of rain a year. So it's certainly possible to harvest these resources, resources that I think really are going to become precious resources, even in areas where we think they're abundant. So that's something I really wanted to mention to you guys as we go into a year of sort of uncertainty yet again, 2020, 2021, 2022. The world is getting kind of weird. And I think one good thing that we can all do is become a little bit more self-sufficient. Now for me, that's raising chickens, that's growing my own food. For you, it might mean something completely different, but I certainly hope that what you learn here at Epic Gardening does help you learn how to grow in general. With that said, good luck in the garden and keep on growing.